Well, that's what I, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> Thanks. I will, I will have a, I have a, I will make sure that we don't miss any questions. So yeah, I would say let's just start and let's use all the time that we have. Um, so first of all, to everyone who already dialed in, welcome and great that you joined our breakout session and Expo 10 and I edition. Um, I that the first session you joined but this is like a breakout session so we really want to have a very interactive discussion here um feel free to ask all your questions in the chat box and um yeah so the topic here is decoding digital innovation projects and we're having amazing speakers here and an amazing moderator so um i'd like to introduce you all to Ferang Jones, the deputy director of the University of Stuttgart, Nick White, senior digital business manager from Murata, Heik Memke, head of commercial commercialization and partnerships at Linde Digital, and Andreas Plug, senior innovation manager at BASF. And yeah, at that point, I would already hand over to you, Ferran, because you are um, our moderator and will, you will lead us a little bit through the session today. And yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to your discussion. And yeah, everyone in the audience really feel free to ask all the, all the questions in the Q&A or in the chat box. And yeah, let's kick it off. Thanks a lot, uh, Victoria. And as, as usually happens in the university, I always need a support tool. So I'm gonna be using a presentation that will help me. So this is the, the panel that also Victoria has already introduced. And, the way we would like to structure the session is that we will start, we will do a very short intro from the university side, but then we would like to open up very quickly to a round, a first round of questions that the panel will be answering and starting to discuss. Then we might have additional rounds. And as Victoria mentioned, we are also looking forward to those questions coming from the chat, and then we can take them as part of the Q&A. So this is us, uh, Dominic and me, that we are at, uh, having the honor to moderate this session. As Victoria already did the introduction, I'm not gonna spend seconds on that. I'm just move ahead. What is the departure point of this session? What you see here on the left side, so it's a kind of the, the back end of what you see sometimes on the other side, the nice digital innovation projects. And always behind there is a complex structure, processes, um, uh, it's something that it's not easy. And we would like to argue that this is particularly difficult for those that are not born digital. So those that are doing this type of digital transformation transitions. So there are two questions that we will try to advance, discuss during the next hour or 50 minutes that we have left. How working with startups can help us to do this digital transformation journey in industrial companies or chemical companies and also, what can we learn from the recent years of ex uh, experience that we have had at the Startup Autobahn or other contexts so that maybe we can share some valuable lessons, as I think we call them hard-earned lessons, no? To get started, uh, yeah, so we will just bring an, an anecdote to the table. We are not bringing specific insights, but we hopefully bring an anecdote that maybe helps to spark uh, the discussion and frame what we want to talk about. We would like that we make an exercise and we go back to 1997, 1998. And there was this statement at one point at one of these uh, famous context um, uh, expos where Bill Gates said, if General Motors had kept up with the technology like the computer industry has, we would be driving $25 cars that would drive 1,000 miles per gallon. As you can imagine, this statement was um, kind of... Um, quite strong. What we try to understand, again, this is uh, more than 23 years ago, but what we understand that Bill Gates at that time uh, leading Microsoft was trying to say is that not all industries have kept up with the digital technologies development, something that we can still argue now. And also, he, maybe his point was also that the digital or the software logic on innovation or innovation projects looked like it was faster and maybe more efficient based on the numbers that he was trying to use. And also the last point he was raising up is that maybe the automotive industry and their suppliers and the supply chain behind had not yet taken, at least at that time, the digitalization opportunity, what now we call the digital transformation. However, what happened after this? And I will let Dominic uh, do the counterpoint on this perspective. Thanks. 
uh, because obviously GM was not too happy about that very uh, controversial statement by Bill Gates. And so GM themselves um, put out a press release saying that if GM developed their cars like Microsoft did with their software, um, we would have cars today that for no reason at all would crash twice a day. Um, but you would have to buy a new car whenever the, the lines on the road uh, would be painted. Um, that your car uh, would die on the freeway for no reason. You would have to close all the windows, restart the car and reopen the windows before you could continue your journey. Occasionally executing a standard maneuver like a left turn would cause your car to shut down and refuse to restart until you reinstall your engine. Uh, furthermore, Apple would also start making cars that would be powered by the sun, would be reliable and five times as fast, but they would only run on 5% of the roads that we have. For some reason though, taking the perspective of Microsoft, you would simply accept it. <laughs> so what the first, the first reaction that we were having on this old story was actually, this is not a joke only. So recently, for example, we could see the case of the, some of these self-driving taxis, WIMOS, that actually were having the situation that the GM guys already envisioned uh, 20 years ago. This was a case, for example, it's still a test um, uh, car, but actually the car got stopped in the middle of nowhere and because they were, they were construction works and uh, they needed to send an assistance person to actually restart and actually drive the car out of that situation. But let's continue with the response of GM. Exactly. GM had some further statements about the Microsoft-like car. Because they said um, with, the, with the development that Microsoft did, all the warning lights that a car has would be replaced by just a single general car default warning light. The airbag system would ask whether you're sure before deploying airbags. Occasionally and for no reason whatsoever, your car would lock you out and only uh, let you in again if you simultaneously lift the door handle, turn the key and grab the antenna on top of your car. Furthermore, every time GM would introduce a new model, car buyers would have to learn how to drive all over again because none of the controls would work the same manner as in the old cars. And most um, broadly, of course, you would of course have to press the start button to shut off the engine. However, still you would accept this. What we found interesting as part of those jokes was the comment at the time that GM was saying that, yes, and also you would have to pay for these upgrades or additional elements that you would get in the software or on the basic car that you would have. Actually, again, they were predicting something that we are now discussing. When we see the digital innovation and the way that it has been entering in this industry, we now, for example, have quotes. Uh, this is a recent article from the Financial Times that they say actually the surprising feature that um, uh, Tesla uh, brings into the cars that you actually end up paying $10,000 for this potential autonomous or autonomous or self-driving car. It's actually much more than the profit that they make by selling Teslas or at least selling some of their car models. So bringing it back now to the starting of the, of the discussion we were having. We propose, and sorry, Dominic, I think that you are leading on this one. So you, we propose to open up discussing. What do we want to discuss first? Yes, yeah, so for the first uh, round of discussion, um, we propose two questions to start off with. Um, so first, how can working with uh, startups contribute to our digital transformation efforts uh, that we pursue in our uh, industrial companies? And furthermore, what types of digital innovation projects are you currently running with startups or possibly planning to do so? Thank you. And as usual, so we maybe run a bit out of time. So now it's, it's the time to bring the panel in. And what we would like to start is in no particular order, but we would like to maybe suggest Hike if he's okay to get started on, on discussing the different points of view. I will stop sharing so that we can see the faces better of each other. Okay, a quick intro or should I just start talking? <laughs> <laughs> I think, so uh, my idea is that you have uh, high, now you have the floor, so they Perfect. use, and then we will invite Andreas and then Nick. Okay, like, Perfect. Prepare each other for who comes next. Okay, so uh, just, just to be quick, I, I represent the Linde, uh, Linde 
uh, digital basically and uh, also a, a um, the, the gas industry basically which is certainly not so exposed to disruption risks as, as other industries so just to frame this uh, as a disclaimer before actually so uh, yeah let me zoom out a little bit so working with startups is of course extremely important but let me zoom out what how we understand digital transformation is basically so two things is I think first of all you need to increase the digital capabilities of a huge organization like Linda, right? Just to basically be ready for the uh, fast changing digital world. So this is one thing, right? And I think startups play a significant role because you can see how startups operate, right? How they develop things, how they try, try out things quickly, unconventionally, right? With low budget. The second thing is uh, after you have built up the digital capabilities in your organization, I think what you need to do is uh, you need to do projects, right? This is very, very important because if you just leave a bootcamp where you were basically taught to how to do a, an agile a project in an agile manner, right? It doesn't help you on your day-to-day -day business. You have to do projects in your day-to-day -day business, basically, to be more efficient, to drive top line, to gain, so to say, internal credibility, right? So, again, one thing is digital capabilities, but another thing is then you have to look at concrete projects to drive top line and bottom line. So, and now a second question, startups. Yeah, we work heavily with startups, right? In our, um, in our digital, so to say, innovation process. So we, we believe that you cannot uh, in-house, so to say, have all the resources available, right? And um, to tackle all those issues. So we work heavily with startups just to see what kind of solution is available. We're gonna, play we're going to try out want to see whether the solution is is good for us on a concrete topic on a con concrete problem and then of course we implement that solution quickly right so this is our and we can talk about this later but this just as an opener basically how we see this topic in the context of digital transformation thanks a lot um Heik. i would like now to invite andreas also to share um, his perspective yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, so um, I'm from BASF, and, and uh, I think the same uh, as uh, Heik mentioned. Uh, we are a big company, uh, usually not uh, playing with uh, dealing with startups. Uh, normally, we are dealing with big companies uh, like the big players uh, in in in, uh, in the area of uh, technology and production. And and uh, uh, it's, it's uh, as you said, totally difficult uh, to, to bring startups with uh, with new ideas into that world where they are uh, common to work with that big sol uh, solution providers and uh, don't see that that focus that a startup brings into our technology. So um, uh, I see it as well that there's a, there's a kind of change, of cultural change we need. Uh, so uh, we need to learn with uh, these small startups with a very specific solutions and uh, they they very precisely uh, going onto onto one step and not solving a whole enterprise uh, problem in one like uh, the big players uh, do. So regarding uh, startup collaboration, so we're happy that uh, we are um, startup Autobahn member uh, since 2017. Uh, so with the program two, we 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 are member of startup Autobahn, and, and so we had a lot of experience with them. Um, uh, dealing with startups and, and one uh, thing that, that is uh, definitely needed or, or positive uh, uh, is to reduce uh, the all administration things so uh, procurement NDA stuff and these things so uh, we uh, um, uh, created a so-called fast track process um, where we where we get a simple document that we can share uh, with the with, with the startups that we have a simple procurement process that is understandable by the small companies as well um, and um, as well yeah, easy uh, approval processes to get projects done so that we are fast in that and that we can build up um, the uh, the possibility uh, to our uh, specialists in our company to work with startups together and get the, this experience from these high emotional teams uh, to work together with them instead of the big companies who uh, are planning half a year and <laughs> working one year and these things and with the startup companies you can do this in, in, in a few months and, and, and uh, this shows how effective that could be. 
a lot, um, Andreas, also for the inputs. Then let's continue the. Uh, thank you, Ash, Farron. And uh, so, from from my side personally, um, uh, I'm relatively new to communicate uh, networking within this environment of the uh, startup autobar. Um, it's actually opened my eyes um, to um, a concept or thoughts of using startups, which I'd never considered before. Um, just repeating what Andrea Andreas has just said, here at Murata, where I work, very large global company, um, working with startups on a daily basis is not something we've uh, historically been used to. Um, my colleague, who is not joining us today, has been part of this uh, startup autobahn for some time. And he has certainly started to utilize startups with regards to uh, business uh, innovation and business uh, incubation. Um, other than that, you know, certainly if we look at business processes, which is something that I'm looking at, we certainly have not considered this before. Um, and this is the reason I wanted to uh, discuss within this forum was to actually get feedback and ideas from the larger companies as to how they are handling and tackling the challenge of uh, digital uh, business innovation. Um, and what I have learned and what I now realize um, is that I've become aware that it, as well as understanding the challenges from established um, firms and organizations, that startups are in a unique position to be able to offer solutions from a viewpoint um, on how they perceive the future. Um, where myself, the established companies, we're looking at it based on our history and our experience. So the company I work for founded in 1944. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a huge amount of history and there's a huge amount of success within that history. Um, and we have done really well to get to where we are today based on those processes and, and, that, uh, and those, uh, that mindset and that way of thinking. Um, but think the world is changing. The world is changing and we need people, and I'm interested in this hearing from people, who are able to think about the future perhaps without the constraints of all of those previous mindsets. Um, and that's what I'm interested to see uh, from, uh, from these startup companies and from this uh, environment. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a quick follow-up question, maybe connecting what Nick was mentioning and what uh, Hype mentioned before and also Andreas. So does it mean in this idea of collaborating with startups to also contribute to the whole organizational journey towards digital transformation, does it mean that um, we should not or, or that it's more difficult to work with startups when it comes to efficiency or bottom line type of projects versus when it comes to developing new services or reimagining the future? Or, or no, or there are ways to still make efficiency oriented bottom line projects with startups. I don't know if I, I, I would address this to Hike, but uh, feel free to react if you also have other points. Mm. Yeah, I think for, so for our company and industry, we work for startups like 80%. We drive efficiency and bottom line um, simply because um, our we don't have a digital product, basically, right? The, the gas molecule stays the gas molecule and we need to ship the gas molecule uh, not in a non-digital manner to the customer and make the customer happy, right? But we believe we can uh, innovate, uh, digitally innovate, so to say, along across the value chain, right? From production distribution to the customer, right? And so we focus mainly on efficiency topics. And just to give you a taste, um, so for example, um, RPA topics like drive efficiency heavily, um, and then in, in, the, in the field of operations and field of supply chain, we do a lot of uh, artificial intelligence for demand forecasting, so to say, right, to optimize our, our distribution. And then we will also do a lot of projects, uh, customer facing like lead generation or pricing topics also. So, so again, for us, the majority is like efficiency, but also we also try try to drive a little bit top line, of course, the pricing, what I just mentioned, for example, um, or if, if you look at alternative financing solutions, for example, for uh, customers, for our engineering customers, right? Just give you a taste. For you, Andreas, in your context, the experience on the type of projects that you usually engage with is yeah, I think uh, uh, we have um, a bit broader mix. Uh, uh, maybe it's 
it's based really on, on the uh, on the experience we have with uh, with the startup. So efficiency is definitely one that we focus as well. So uh, in all the stuff, uh, supply chain planning, uh, all this stuff is uh, there's a lot of lot of possibilities inside. Uh, and, and the main technology is the artificial intelligence world uh, based on big data and, and these things. So data lakes, all this stuff uh, is in every uh, in every event's world, but um, on the other side, we have as well some some really small solutions where where we where they come up and uh, as you know we uh, we are we have big sites big uh, production sites and they are mashed together so um, so called verbund sites and, and and we have a lot of experts on these sites running these production sites in that area and there are a lot of topics we faced uh, as well with uh, uh, with startup there there was one example as well uh, shown in um, uh, in, in in one of the expos of, of Startup Autobahn was with Blinko together. They they develop uh, video analytics for cars, so so to see if the driver gets tired or not, and these things. And uh, we saw that and say, okay, yeah, when when you can use that that analytics, can you can you check all the personal security equipment on our uh, on our construction sites where we're building big uh, a big um, uh, production uh, plans. Uh, and they, they they did so and, and created something so so this helps us uh, to reduce security issues uh, on 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 big con uh, construction size um, um, but as well other measurements of, of of pipelines and and other things so we are really using that from from planning travel activities or optimizing this one uh, up to planning activities uh, and as well technology things uh, regarding uh, uh, production steering uh, is as well something uh, uh, that uh, where, where we focus on. Um, and I think this is this is the major point. Uh, I think working with startups, uh, what what we learned is. Um, so the startups are not really creating new solutions for the chemical or process industries. So chemical and process industries are not the typical target for startups. So it's it's really more service uh, service delivery uh, like like Airbnb and and, and, and this stuff, um, or it's the automotive. So so the the uh, so the manufacturing, the discrete uh, uh, discrete manufacturing industry. So you need to to translate or to transfer their product or their solution into our world of, of chemical production and, and process industries. And uh, if you help them doing that, uh, then you get the acceptance on the other side in in the in the uh, specialist departments uh, we have in the, in the ESF, uh, so that they say, okay, it's let us let us come together let's hear what they are doing maybe there are some aspects in there that that are usable even they are not really built exactly for that so so this is something uh, that we learned you need to uh, you need to to translate their solution into into the the world you are living sorry before we turn to nick because i think that we would also like to hear from nick point but andres would would then you agree or not that then you are taking a bit of this function that Nick was commenting before about imagining what could work. And you are doing this work of inviting or translating or making attractive for that startup yeah. to also think about the chemical or other type of industries where maybe they didn't think as the first application case of their technology. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's definitely the point. Uh, um, and you need to open up their... their um, their product plan. So they normally have a product portfolio, and and and, and they have a a target customer field. And 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 now you you need to do and say, okay, you had to, you have developed that, but that technology you can really help us. And in sometimes we see that uh, startups really create a new department in their company, in their small company, and say, okay, let these four guys focus on the BASF stuff, uh, because maybe there's something inside we can sell on. On Linda, <laughs> or or on any any other uh, process industry type. So um, this is something where we at Captive need to need to help them as well to 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 get a grip on that domain uh, that is not this visible in 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 the technical world than automotive is. 
Andres, because I think that that helps to, to also understand that um, sometimes in these collaborations, again, with this idea of that they contribute to the initiatives that you have inside the organization, we need to accept that to, uh, about coding or decode the internal how the things work inside the organization. No? And that you maybe sometimes have to step up and take that role of being the translator or the, the one that decodes yeah. what is going yeah. on so they understand and they say, hey, this makes sense. Maybe we should allocate some of our scarce resources, but pay attention to Andreas is saying or what Hike is saying about the, uh, the opportunities that we also have there. Before Absolutely. I turn, I turn to Nick. I don't know, Hike, if you wanted to mention on that because or comment on that. Otherwise, I'll turn to Nick and maybe we do another round. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Nick, I don't know if that, that does this fit with you because I know that you are also uh, in this process of imagining and seeing this additional value contribution from the startups. No? Does it fit with your ideas of what you are thinking about how to engage with them so that they actually bring some something new onto the table? Uh, my expectations are that, that, that certainly it would make sense to follow the similar experience that Andreas has already had. Um, um, and as I mentioned before, you know, I've gone from not considering startups as part of the solution with regards to business processes to realizing that they can be. Um, now, as I said, whereas my colleague is looking at things more from a from a technical perspective, who's not joining him today, so definitely, you know, he's seen a lot of benefit from from technical uh, the technical solutions. So we, we're an electronics manufacturing com company, um, and whether that's software related, hardware related, um, you know, there's there's various um, areas where we could improve with the help of a startup and collaborate with them. From my perspective. Yeah, I'm more interested in you know, some of the conversations we've started to have to improve that business process. Now, as my my thoughts and my experience in those discussions increases, I would expect to be able to have more discussion with and feedback with startups as to these are the challenges that that that, that I'm facing within our company. You know, one of the biggest challenges I have is that you know, as as you know, fair enough, I mean, I am not the decision maker. I am leading digitalization here in Europe. But you know, we are a global company, um, and what it, you know, I, we can't just put something in um, to make a small fix in Europe. You know, we need to think how that fits um, in a, in a global organisation. And of course, that will be the same for Hike and Andreas and the other large um, large organisation. Um, but we shouldn't we shouldn't give up. We should. You know, there's, this is the time now to actually um, learn. Uh, and see what it is we can do in, in a positive way to uh, to move us forward and to help support these startups at the same time. Let me please uh, follow Nick and maybe hike. Uh, now I would like to ask your help. And so how how does this what Nick is mentioning this um, sometimes connection or disconnection between the groups or the people that are leading or pushing for this digitalization efforts and how the whole organization is also changing or evolving. I remember you mentioned uh, interesting insights on also how has changed the way that the, that you over or you see the global the global picture of this digitalization inside Linda, or maybe the the priorities that you were having also on how the, the the story has changed. I don't know if I'm clear enough with my question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So so we drive the digital projects. So uh, like I said before, I think the, first of all we have to make sure we increase the capabilities right so that the organization understands also the need but i think for us what we have learned is it's very important that we always kind of work uh, closely with the organization first you know identify like uh, problems they they might have and then uh, consider jointly what could be a solution right and the startup could be a solution or an internal development could be a solution I think that is for us at least crucial, right? It might be different for, for Morata or for BSF. Again, we drive efficiency projects. So if you go, if you follow this path, basically you're gonna get the buy-in from the business at the very beginning because you help them, right? To, to solve a concrete pro problem. And uh, on the other hand, it's also very good for the startups you have identified because then for them, you know, they understand, hey, that's not a game, right? It's, it's real. And so they have, a, they have a very concrete use case and they have also another person sitting on the table who has the authority to sign a check down the road, right? So that's how we, you know, what we 
what we experienced, uh, where we believe which that is a success or a success factor right, to work with SOAPs. Sorry, elaborating on this, is there a, a, a downside of this approach? So also in your experience, so specific didn't allow for something else to happen in this collaboration. Uh, can you rephrase a little bit? I mean, I don't, I don't see any yeah, downsides, no. right? The, the only thing is maybe if I understand it correctly, if you really look for exploratory stuff, right? If you want to open, so to say, your eyes to allow to see any solutions that could help us can, broadly, right? But this is not what we what we do, right? Because we think uh, that the business again they they need to basically uh, work with the customer, build the product, right? And we need to help them on a daily basis, right? If there's exploratory stuff to be tackled. Of course, we're also uh, with them, right? But no, I, I would say that's the way to go for us. Right? You need it, to I mute myself because that's exactly the point I, I wanted to also bring up because sometimes we believe um, there should be, I cannot work with the startups on this kind of a more short, clear defined problems because it's, I need to, it's too urgent. It's the same thing that we always say that don't engage with the university for, for very specific and, and, and short term projects because it will take them long time to get organized, long time to respond. So that's why we always, you should think about projects that are nice to have, but maybe not must have in the short uh, term. But that's, I think you're, you're showing that this can be done actually. If you structure it well, if you organize yourself well, if you are clear, honest, maybe transparent also on the needs, then this can be done and it's a good way to do it. Yeah, plus I think we're also looking uh, for like more later stage type of startups that they have already a solution in place. Maybe that a solution that already is working for BSF, for example, right? So it make, makes it also much uh, much faster to, to, to implement at Linde, right? Or to try out whether it works or not. Right? You mentioned before that your portfolio of projects was more uh, varied or more diverse. Does it also affect on the what we were just commenting now with Hike, or you see it um, in different ways? Yeah, it's. Uh, um, I think it's a it's a bit on the on the historic that we that we uh, that we were. So uh, we stepped in with startup Autobahn, and and uh, this was at the beginning. It was a, a lot of automotive stuff inside. So. Um, uh, we really have to think about uh, how does it fit into BSF because we are we are a big automotive supplier, uh, but with raw materials, plastics, coatings, <laughs> all these stuffs. Uh, but uh, we are not dealing with uh, traffic controls, autonomous vehicles, and and, and these things. Uh, so so we have some autonomous uh, um, uh, trucks. Uh, uh, truck platforms on the side, but uh, we don't develop it uh, ourselves. So um, there are really there are really two sides, and, and as Hike said, uh, there are uh, there are some some uh, startups they have their product in place, and and they they get in a uh, uh, um, in. Yeah, in a in a mix to to uh, to our big solution providers that we already have. So so the problem is, uh, um, uh, as as well as Nick mentioned uh, here, uh, we are as well a global company, and and if we if we create or if we if we build up a solution, it needs to work on a global basis. Uh, so uh, we as well look for enterprise solutions, global solution, and these stuff. But you don't find. Or you hardly find startups that uh, that make that possible on a global solution because they are located in South America or they are located in India, and so uh, you don't find these small companies uh, uh, to serve all these big stuff. Um, what what we are doing is really make our our group and and, and this this is a, a bit on that capability building. We make our group, uh, um, um, yeah. Have a look on these on these specific solutions that they have, and uh, that they transform it, or that that they try to transform it into a global solution. So in in some cases, we we just go in, we uh, we uh, we run a project with them in a certain area, maybe North America or maybe Europe, um, uh, in in one plant, in in one problem selection, and and see how it works. And we call it uh, um, so 
some guys call it POC, uh, we call it POV. So like um, 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 uh, yeah, proof of value. So is, is the technology and is the idea that the startup has, is this valuable for BASF? And could this be a, um, a solution that could be uh, that could be used in several areas. And then we go into the contest and say, okay, uh, let this roll out maybe only in that one country and see how it works. And then we go to the big ones, SAP, and these ones say, okay, these small guys, they, they are doing that job. Uh, and, our, and our people are happy with that. Uh, how would you work on a solution that could be, uh, that could be rolled out on, on a global basis? And uh, uh, as you see, when you look, when you look to, to SAP or the big providers in, in, in that area, they do the same. Uh, they look for young startups and buy them, and buy them in and make them part of their product. So, um, so, so this is what we do as well to 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 be faster uh, in, uh, in 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 setting up digital ideas uh, uh, into our organization. Show the organization that there are solutions out there that are better and more efficient than the big ones that uh, that are sold by by, by our standard provider. Just to clarify, the, the idea of the POV, after a POC, or is it a different concept? You know, we say, we say when, when a startup has a product, uh, we believe in that the concept is working. So, so they have a working product. There are some really, really new one. They only have an idea, and then and they are looking for something. So, uh, as well, we are working with universities and and and, and, and uh, small groups of of scientists and these things. But when we talk about startups, they they they, they normally have a product and they want to sell it to to customers. So we, we believe that this stuff is working. So uh, we, we are looking uh, if this is valuable for us. So uh, we don't want that they, that they reprogram their solution. Uh, we want to see what's their idea in their solution. So, so what's behind it and want to understand it, why they are uh, modeling uh, this product in that way and not in, and not in other way. And uh, maybe we use it or maybe we uh, 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 we go to to our ventures department and say please invest in that <laughs> yeah, because it's cool. That is another thing we we, we do as well, uh, and we try then to to, well, to 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 bring this into into a valuable situation for BASF. Uh, quick, 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 so I really like this POV, Andreas, simply yeah. because it connects. You know, if a technical solution works, that's fine, right? But for us, it's it's important again, and I need to stretch this point that you bottom line, right? By the end of the day, with your solution. So before we start actually a project, we also want to make sure that there's a there's a significant business case, right? Of course, high level at this stage, but this is very crucial for us, and that's why I like this POV really to understand the value what is coming out of this, and you can put it of course against the costs that that comes with the solution, and then see whether you have a nice case or not, right? So that's why that's the way to go. Yeah. That's it. Well, hi, culture for the follow-up. I was. I think that it's. Um, it it shows that there are additional pathways that we need to consider, and that can help us to 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 alleviate or to compensate some of these shortcomings that uh, sometimes these collaborations have. Um, I would say now we are crossing the, or we have crossed the equator of the um, of the session. Uh, as Anton mentioned, and I also insisted, so if you have questions uh, now, if, so you can write them on the on the chat. Just let us know, because otherwise I, I will keep monopolizing this uh, the the question. But I, I would welcome now also as Hi did. So please also, if Andreas, Hi, Konik, if you also have questions or comments for each other, please let's start to open up more. The I think we have covered the. The first part of the discussion. Now we really, we are more free to to cover. With that, I would like to maybe invite Nick to also, as we have been discussing, or Andreas and Hike have been pointing out uh, additional elements. Do you see this working at Murata as a possibility? Do you, you do you? Or is it a very different context in the electronics that you cannot do this type of approach? Um, I'm a great believer in anything is possible. Um, the one of the challenges and we talk about you know, lessons learned is and as i've already mentioned is, is the size of the company and how so many of the, the business processes are entrenched in um in the success that we have received uh, have achieved so far up until today 
Um, and for me, the challenges are, uh, and again, I like uh, Andreas's uh, yeah, POV as well. You know, how can how can I prove to my counterparts globally, um, and specifically in Japan, where where our headquarters are, as to whether or not something, whatever the solution is, is it worth investing in? Um, yeah, and to an extent, we do do things on a regional basis. We do test things out on a regional basis within the company. Um, and if that works, we see whether or not we can then bring other regions in. Um, yeah, but you know, one, one of the areas that I see a, a huge amount of is that, and I guess this is, we're not the only company here, um, but you know, many companies have successfully built their business and relied on you know, the traditional suite of Microsoft products, for instance. You know, so trying to get people and colleagues to think outside of Excel, PowerPoint and Power BI and think that there's another solution out there, that for me is a huge challenge. You know, if, you know, and and, and you know, having uh, very successful um, solutions, which can, you know, we, we can uh, have a successful activity and proof of value to show that this is a better way of doing it than downloading it into Excel and uploading it from Excel and uh, and all of these sort of activities. Um, this is a big challenge for me because I can guarantee that, you know, maybe 80, you know, it's, it's a very Pareto system, 2080, I would say 80% you know, of, of, of the people I talk to internally will, are, are too busy. We're all very busy, too busy to be thinking about a different way of doing things and, and just want to get it done the way they've always done it. Yeah, because I know how an Excel pivot table works and I'm an expert in Excel pivot table. So that's where I'm going to stay and uh, keep keeping my comfort zone as opposed to actually coming away from that and looking at something different. So this is where personally I'm starting to feel as though I can see you know, seeing what startups are thinking about, what uh, startups are proposing um, helps me to broaden my um, outlook um to see what uh, and, and then to broaden the, the discussions that i can have internally with regards to you know can we can we do a pov in europe in europe is that acceptable to to our headquarters and if it is then by all means let's do that um or even better can we can we do something globally um but yeah this is this is this is a huge and, and the other area which is quite big for us is over the last two years we've had a lot of m a's within our company uh, so you know, you know, maybe before 10 years ago, not so many, but the last 10 years, a lot of M&As. And you know, that brings with it more challenges as well. There's great additional uh, products in our portfolio. But at the same time, we've also got additional platforms that we have to work with as we try to incorporate all these different platforms into our, in, into our, into our business. Um, you know the data entanglement uh, andreas mentioned earlier you know we talk about big data we talk about data lakes you know how how can we use that effectively you know, do we pump all of the data into one data lake and then simply look at the data through one you know and pump it back out into excel or pump it back out into power bi or do we actually try to do something a little bit more dynamic with that that's that can give us some more analytics um uh, and give us a more dynamic approach um, to, to how we look at our data. So yeah, th th these are all the challenges I'm facing at the moment. And I would be very interested from, uh, from experience from uh, Hype, Andreas, or anyone else that's listening as to how they are coping with those sort of challenges. So if I start first, real quick on the uh challenges with the existing infrastructure and you mentioned because of m and activities there might be different systems in place and different you know so what, what we do is and again i'm using andreas pov if you do a pov we try to do it really outside the uh, uh, uh so to say infrastructure that is existing of course we're going to comply with the internal rules right data security gdpr, GDPR that's clear crystal clear right but we want to try out so to say very fast that it works or not right on a very, very, very small scale. So that's why I would also say you need to you need to start local. And of course, it, when it works, then you can deal with the IT, right? To make sure that you integrate the product and then you can scale it globally, right? But to start 
locally. I think that was also something that works works for us basically. And then again, find a find the arrangement with IT to make it make it big basically. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think this is this is as well one uh, one one point uh, when 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 you get it uh, run locally and and you have a, a user community uh, are, um, are happy working with that thing and and could really do their merchandising for for that for that solution for you. You need these people. Uh, um, uh, these these early adopters really uh, uh, say, okay, uh, uh, please, colleague, try that out. I, I, I've tried it, and it's better than Excel. Uh, if you don't have these people, uh, you as an innovation manager are are top down. You can't go to these people and say, uh, please, uh, um, yeah, put away your Excel and then use another product. You need these people from 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 the basis uh, who are happy with the solution, and then you are able to uh, uh, to to change things, so it's change management at the end. <laughs> yeah, as yeah. Ever. yeah no, I appreciate that, and that, that certainly is an area I have a, a, a huge amount of experience in uh, internally as well within the last few years with our, our CRM system as, a, as, a, as an example. You know, we, we moved to a new CRM system, and exactly that, Andreas, you know, I, you know, in, you, know, you, you, you implement it, and then suddenly everybody doesn't understand what benefit they can get from it. And it doesn't matter how many workshops or things you do, the, the, the best way or the most effective way was to actually have, as you refer to them as early adopters, you know, our own little you know, experts. So once the penny dropped with them, once they could see what, what benefit it was to them as an individual, then they spread the word amongst their team, amongst their department, and it, and it snowballs from there. So, yes, that's, that's certainly an, an area which is uh, I, I have experience and would agree is, is helpful. Yeah. Um, to take on board here as well. Thank you. Here, by the way, let the business talk. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the business is key, but at the end of the day, business is paying our, our salaries, right? Mm. So that's why we, our, our you know, thing is uh, let's uh, make the business happy, right? Show them quickly the result, basically, on, on their concrete issue, problem, right? And then uh, let's go from there. So that's our philosophy. Thanks a lot. Um, okay. um, Nick, do you want to add a uh, follow up? You know, because um, we still have a few minutes. I have one kind of like final round question, but uh, I think that we, I don't want to cut the, the nice flow that was going on. Be careful, Nick, you need to unmute. Sorry. I thought I'd just done that. Apologies. Um, I, yeah, the, one of the other areas which I've um, recognized, um, which is happening in, in some regions in our company faster than others, is the, is the inherent need for organizational change. So, you know, digitalization, as I see it, is not it's not a goal. You know, you know, a business transformation is a goal, and digitalization is a is is one of the methods to achieve that. Um, you know, and this huge mindset change needs a very strong um, lead, strong leadership, but it also needs quite a bit of organizational change because it touches everywhere in the company. You know, you can't just say I'm in charge of dig digitalization and have a department of 10 people saying we're doing digitalization in a company of 80,000 people, um, it, it simply isn't going to work. You know, it, it, the actual organizational structure needs to change in order to have your chief digital uh, digital officer and, and so on and so forth. How is that? How, is, how have you ever handled that in, in both your companies, Hike and Andreas? So my experience in that is really, um, you have uh, you can't do organizational uh, what you want. Uh, you you need to find the the willing team. Uh, so so there are uh, at the end uh, um, as well in BASF. This is over the globe. Uh, two handful of people, not not even more, <laughs> uh, that are really experienced and 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 are really uh, pushing innovation. Uh, in in uh, in our company, so um, you need and you need to find, uh, or you you need to grow that team uh, by finding people who are with you. So I can say who are open for innovation, who are open for change, uh, who are uh, more uh, talking or have good networks into their business groups and these things, and you need to uh, to emphasize them. Uh, uh, to bring innovation into uh, into work, um, 
you can try it as well in a, in an organizational way uh, to, to bring out targets be innovative once once a day or <laughs> don't know uh, what but this this don't work because innovation or, or, or change processes are are a bit more difficult than that uh, so so you need these early adopters or these adopters where you really want to work with that and you need to bring them into one team that they that they feel uh, that they feel uh, powerful and that they can move something in, in the organization and you need at the other hand uh, management members who are with you and, and uh, push this as well in the management sector in, in the management level. Uh, if you have these two, two things you can move a lot um, in the first time I think. Yeah. No, I appreciate that, thank you. Yes, that's uh... So roughly where I am at the moment is again it's finding the, the willing teams, but of course you find the willing people. That one might be in IT and one might be in in sales, and another might be in operational. Um, and then without that management structure, and this is where I, you know, I I see in some cases the need to change that structure to make sure that the correct you know, part of your willing team needs to be the management. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, um, <laughs> We, we we are happy in the moment and i think most most of our uh, of our boards are willing to do that uh, digital transformation so uh, i think all the board members uh, of, of our three companies are uh, definitely keen uh, with digital management so so uh, i think this is not not the problem uh, it's the next level uh, you need to uh, you need to to address uh, because they don't want to lose their their common processes and their common uh, uh, teams and, and and these things and 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 they need to to understand that this is not the danger what they are what they are doing it's a chance for them and uh, but this is the difficult part. Yeah, Andreas, you have just summarized uh, my company exactly the same as well. Board members and then the people underneath. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very interesting to hear that, we, that it's uh, the same somewhere else. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, I think what, what, what helps is how you, the question is, and, and, and Nick, I'm with you, right? To, to drive change is a challenge, but you can accelerate the change if uh, if you set like digital productivity targets, uh, for example, per an individual region, right? And then there's a strong pull, of course. Uh, um, of course, they need to understand the value, right? As that is digital really uh, bringing value. But if this is the, if this is the case and they are incentivized, then there's a strong pull, right? And then uh, it's, the, the process starts itself, right? And, but of course, you need to have the uh, the people that are willing to drive the change and uh, yeah, need to make them happy with uh, tangible results. Okay, thank you. And again, the, the, the trick there is to find a, um, a, a realistic, a tangible target as well that you can be attributed to a digital productivity, um, which again depends on whether you're dealing with you know, gas molecules or, uh, or, or, or electronic components. But, uh, okay, no, thank you for that uh, feedback. But, uh, I think that we've managed to make a, a beautiful picture of how this mo uh, movement needs to get started. No? So Haig was highlighting the importance of starting and getting some inertia with something that you are solving a problem, that you are getting people engaged, that are clear wins. Andreas was mentioning the importance of then building upon this inertia to show value inside the corporation, and so show value in the other groups, that more people jump on board, and then you pull things up with the same startup or maybe with other people also that can help you to do that. But then definitely, Nick, I think you're also bringing here the, that it's, this is a process that will not end in one project. This is a process that is ongoing and it challenges the whole organizational structure. And uh, so we have worked for, for, for many years, so that our work doesn't finish here. Uh, with, with this, I, I just want to make sure that uh, maybe Anton, if the, you have received any question or Victoria, if you see any points that we should very quickly address from anyone. I don't see questions in the chat yet, but uh, yeah, we, we already Wrote we are in, one minute so, uh, away from, from time. Yes. So to uh, all the audience, that... feel free to, to, to post in the chat box. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've also been checking it uh, just in case something was popping up, but I, I assume that also the, the, the debate was interesting enough and dynamic enough so that you kept all of us on the hook, listening how the conversation was developing and the topics that were appearing. I would like to just thank again uh, Andreas, Haig, and Nick for uh, joining in this session, for sharing your insights, your hard-learned also insights. So 
thank you to everyone and also thanks to Victoria, Anton and also Dominic for being my sparring partner in this session. So thank you. Thank, thank you so much for, thank you all. For, for the great moderation so, and, and to the others for uh, I think you you already put so many good questions, so um, it wasn't necessary to to have additional ones. So, thank you so much for joining, and um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the expo. There are a lot of other exciting sessions, and looking forward to see you there. Thanks a have lot. A great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank okay, you. Bye bye. See you, Dominic. I'm switching off also. <laughs>